For those uh, just um, entering the webinar, uh, we're going to wait um, a minute or so to allow everyone to join, and then we'll uh, proceed with uh, introductions. So, hello everyone. Thank you uh, so much for joining us for today's book talk. My name is Edward Cunningham. I'm director here at our Ash Center's uh, China programs. And I wanna start with a few announcements uh, on the Ash Center's behalf. First, the Ash Center would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people uh, and a place that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange uh, among nations. We'd also like to thank and acknowledge our co-sponsor for today's talk, the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies uh, at Harvard uh, University. This event is being recorded and the video will be made publicly available on the Ash Center YouTube channel. Just in terms of uh, ground rules, you are welcome to submit questions anytime throughout the duration of the event. Please send them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen instead of submitting them via the chat. So finally, I'd like to introduce our featured author and panelist and friend uh, joining us for today's book talk. Manfred Elfstrom is Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of British Columbia and author of the book we are discussing today, Workers and Change in China, Resistance, Repression, and Responsiveness. Yao Li is Assistant Professor in the Department of Sociology and Criminology and Law at the University of Florida and author of Playing by the Informal Rules, Why the Chinese Regime Remains Stable Despite Rising Protests also uh, published in 2019. Most importantly, both professors Elfstrom and Lee are alums of our China postdoc program here at the Ash Center. So we of course continue uh, to take credit for all the wonderful work they do long after they have left uh, their home here. And we're thrilled uh, to be able to join them again in this event, even if it is only uh, virtual. So in terms of next steps, Manfred will take 15 to 20 minutes to present key arguments from his book. Then we'll turn to Yao who will respond before we open it to audience questions. And remember again, you may submit questions anytime via the Q&A function. And with that, let me hand the floor over to you, Manfred, and welcome back uh, to the Ash Center, my friend. Thanks so much for that introduction. Here, let me share my screen. So good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to be back in the Ash Center among friends, uh, even if it's just virtually. And I'm especially happy to be discussing my new volume with Yao and with Ed because they provided really valuable feedback on an early draft of the manuscript during a book workshop at Ash way back in the fall of 2017. At its most basic level, my book concerns the power of ordinary people to bring about change in difficult political contexts. Specifically, as its title suggests, it shows how resistance by Chinese workers is altering the Chinese state from below, albeit in a contradictory manner, simultaneously building the state's repressive and responsive capacities. I begin the book with a pair of anecdotes. The first dates back to April 2004. At that time, after enduring physical and verbal abuse, poor food, a pay cut, and then a pay delay, thousands of workers went on strike and protested at two shoe factories, Xingang and Xingxiong, 
both owned by the Taiwanese firm Stella International. The incident quickly escalated. Workers smashed production equipment and flipped vehicles belonging to management. And they ended up taking public security aided by 30 factory guards three hours to restore order. Afterward, the police detained dozens of workers and charged 10 of them with intentional destruction of property. But things didn't end there. Labor groups based outside mainland China placed pressure on the multinational sourcing from Stella, urging leniency. Moreover, the renowned human rights lawyer, Gao Zhisheng, agreed to take the accused workers' case and gave a stirring speech in their defense. The outcome, although the workers were initially convicted, they were acquitted on appeal. Fast forward a little over a decade. In 2015, Angry uh, that Stella had not made legally required payments into a housing fund, a thousand employees at Xingang once more took to the streets and they were joined by hundreds of their comrades at Xingqiong. This time, the Chinese state seemed better prepared. Photos of the 2015 protest showed hundreds of riot police lined up in neat formation. Workers were effectively kettled within the factory grounds and canine units were deployed. Lawyer Gao, who gave that dramatic defense in 2004, had long since disappeared into prison, then been released, then disappeared again. Foreign groups had less political room to advocate for the strikers, and multinational social compacts had been scaled back. Labor's options had seemingly been significantly reduced since the last showdown. However, authorities had also become more willing to meet workers halfway. Doubtless under pressure from the government to do its part to maintain social stability, Stella quickly conceded to employee demands, paying the workers their housing subsidy and cash. And a year later, when the Xingang factory shut down entirely, management went above and beyond what was required by law and generously compensated employees avoiding another standoff. Thus, from another perspective, labor was in a much better position than before. So what, I ask, changed in the years between the two incidents? The short answer I give is that workers from all over China, but especially in the country's southeast where Xingang and Xingzhong were located, began taking to the streets. Although official Chinese strike statistics are not available, unofficial counts, uh, including those of China Labor Bulletin, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and my own China Strikes data set, which I rely upon throughout the book and at various points in this presentation, I show a dramatic upward trajectory in workplace conflicts over the course of the early 21st century. Several of these conflicts have captured headlines. The most famous one uh, was this work stoppage at a Honda auto parts plant in Guangdong in 2010 that shut down the company's entire Chinese supply chain and sparked similar actions at other Hyundai, Honda and Toyota plants. Another uh, was this taxi strike in Chongqing in 2008, spread to over a dozen cities around the country. These pictures show a violent protest that blocked the privatization of a steel mill in Jilin province in 2009, and inspired an equally successful anti-privatization effort at a mill in Henan. Here's a strike by almost 40,000 Guangdong shoe factory workers in 2014, probably the biggest single industrial action since the 1949 revolution. In these pictures, you can see a mobilization by workers at an electronics factory in Shenzhen that drew the support of Marxist student groups. And finally, here you can see images from a trucker strike that occurred nationwide in 2018. The result of all this contention, I posit, is that Chinese government governance has uh, profoundly altered in the years between the two Stella strikes and continues uh, to be altered today, uh, but in a contradictory manner. Most of the book is dedicated to tracing the bottom-up process by which I assert this change has taken place, a process that I argue stretches all the way from the dusty shop floors of places like Xingang and Xingxiong to the halls of power in Beijing. And the process looks like this. 
First, you have various combinations of economic sectors and worker demographics that I dub recipes uh, for resistance. These generate different forms of resistance. These different forms of resistance then bump up against state officials' bureaucratic incentives. The central government is intensely concerned about stability, and this concern is transmitted level by level down to local officials in the form of pressures to demonstrate to their superiors that they're on top of things when conflict rises. Demonstrating competence yields distinct regional models of control, different models for different forms of resistance. These models add up on average to increase repressive capacity on the one hand and uh, increased state responsive capacity on the other. This strengthening may be complementary at first. Repression puts an outer bound on how far the resistance responsiveness opportunity spiral can run. And responsiveness might take some of the sting out of repression. But the dual dynamic becomes contradictory over time as repression undermines the trust built by responsiveness and responsiveness encourages the very activism repression is meant to deter. More broadly, investment in these two forms of capacity inevitably comes at the expense of other forms of capacity building. The process hurts the alliance with business people that the Communist Party has cultivated since the early reform era. And it's just extremely difficult to expertly balance carrots and sticks forever. So in the end, you have a lurching, warped form of political development. Let's take this process one step at a time, beginning with the recipes for resistance. Certain factors tend to coincide with higher worker militancy. You can see here, for example, how strikes cluster in counties with higher migrant worker populations, the darker shaded counties in this map. I show that in places like this and in sectors like light industry, construction and transportation, there's more of what I call transgressive and borrowing from Kevin O'Brien, boundary spanning resistance. In contrast, in places with higher tech, higher value added industries and more local workers, you see more contained resistance. Next, these different forms of resistance meet the bureaucratic incentives felt by grassroots cadres to demonstrate to their superiors that they're on top of things. Interviews I've conducted show the extraordinary pressure that unrest places on individual officials. So a government researcher in Nanjing said to me, officials are judged as much or more on stability as they are in economic development. Doesn't matter how much you grow the economy, if you have a lot of big incidents, that cancels out your economic achievements. And a labor bureau official in Tianjin said, why do officials care? Every year, the city will review their reports. The officials from different places will just have to sit there and not be able to say anything while the city notes uh, where he or she has done well or badly. This puts a lot of pressure on people. Such pressure isn't just some free-floating anxiety, it comes with real career consequences. Here you can see that membership turnover on the politics and law committee responsible for stability maintenance in Shenzhen, a leading city in the strike-prone Pearl River Delta, has been much higher than turnover in the politics and law committee of Suzhou in the relatively calm Yangtze River Delta. Given this sort of churn in personnel, Bureaucrats in contentious places have strong reasons to signal to their higher ups that they're doing all they can to keep the situation under control. As you can see in this pair of graphs, as labor unrest has grown in the Pearl River Delta compared to the Yangtze River Delta, the public security sections of Pearl River Delta municipal and provincial almanacs had devoted more attention to workplace issues as measured by their mentions of a number of key labor terms presumably in a bid to reassure upper levels of the state. But local governments don't stop at reassuring messaging. They take action via their different arms, the public security apparatus, the official trade union, the labor inspectorate, etc. Sometimes these arms coordinate closely. Other times they each do their own thing. But regardless, the various actions taken congeal into distinct regional models of control. 
I demonstrate how in the moderate unrest, Young's River Delta, where unrest generally takes the form of contained or at most boundary spanning resistance, the approach pursued by authorities can be characterized as preemption, caution, and nudging, or what I call an orthodox model of control. While in the high unrest Pearl River Delta, the approach can be characterized as reaction, experimentation, and crackdowns, or what I call a risk-taking model of control. More specifically, Jiangsu officials carefully monitor workplaces, nipping burgeoning disputes in the bud, but only passing the most incremental labor laws that simply tweak national policies while allowing their branches of the state-controlled union federation to focus on old state socialist era welfare functions. Businesses are prodded into line with things like a harmonious enterprises initiative, and local labor NGOs are given government office space and steered away from sensitive issues. In contrast, in Guangdong, officials don't try to head off each and every conflict. There are simply too many of them. Instead, in recent years, they've passed pioneering labor laws uh, that have come close to recognizing a right to strike and have contemplated, but not passed, laws that would insert workers uh, into core corporate decisions. Especially since 2010, the region has supported direct elections for the head of enterprise level unions something long mandated by law, but rarely implemented, and conducted exercises that come close to approximating real collective bargaining. At the same time, the Guangdong government has come down hard on labor NGOs, jailing leading activists for extended periods, and ordinary strikers and particularly high profile incidents are increasingly beaten and detained. Some quotes from my interview should give you a better sense of what I'm talking about. So in the orthodox Yangtze River Delta, a labor official had this to say to me about the local legislative process. Our work style is the first look, second move slow, and third only later put something through. Whereas in the risk-taking Pearl River Delta, China Labor Bulletin and Advocacy Group had this to say about the Guangdong draft law on the democratic management of enterprises. Once this local level legislation has been passed, we think it could trigger a major overhaul of the collective consultation system that's prevailed in China over the last two decades. Another final pair of quotes. In the orthodox Yangtze River Delta, an NGO leader said to me, work for my organization is slowly getting better. People didn't fully understand organizations like this. Now the government is supportive. In contrast, in the risk-taking Pearl River Delta, an NGO leader said, I was just forced to move my home again. They can't find my office, so they make me move my home. In fact, I don't really have much of an office anymore. These regional models of control then add up with a long-term result of more repressive and responsive capacity. To measure responsive capacity, I use provincial level figures on spending on the paramilitary people's armed police, a force that's focused on containing large-scale public disturbances, not everyday crime fighting. Here you can see that such spending has risen uh, both at the central and regional level. And to measure responsive capacity, admittedly a tougher concept to quantify, I use the outcomes of formally adjudicated employment disputes, measured again at the provincial level. More outcomes entirely or even just partially in favor of workers show a greater capacity to buck the will of powerful employers and respond to grassroots pressures. Here are the total number of formally adjudicated employment disputes decided in a pro-worker, split, and pro-business manner nationally. In the graph, all types of decisions are clearly rising. After all, the total number of disputes is rising, but pro-worker and split decisions are obviously rising the fastest. As you can see, changes in strikes are positively and significantly correlated with changes in people's armed police spending as well as pro-worker and split decisions. Specifically, an increase of one strike in my data set is correlated with uh, 96 more cases decided in workers' favor and 67 more decided in a split manner. Meanwhile, there's no significant relationship with pro-business decisions. Increased resistance on average means more repressive and responsive capacity. Finally, I address a remaining issue in my book, elite politics, 
Might not individual politicians complicate the dynamics I've described? For instance, reformers in the government could conceivably raise workers' hopes and encourage protests while also responding to those protests in unique ways. Using a brief analysis of Chongqing, I show that even in this dynamic city under two successive reformist leaders, the liberal Wang Yang and the left populist Bo Xilai, little happened in terms of labor policy because there was only moderate unrest there. But when Wang Yang was transferred to the tumultuous Guangdong, he initiated a number of changes to workplace governance. And none of the workers I interviewed said that they protested any different because these people were in power, although many expressed support for Bo in particular. Thus, politicians may be more or less inclined to shake things up, but whether they direct their energies to tinkering with industrial relations in particular, rather than other issue areas, uh, depends on worker pressure. And workers are mainly driven by structural pressures themselves, not their perception of the political winds in their city. At a national level, things have definitely changed under Xi Jinping. There is more of an emphasis on using the state's repressive capacity than its responsive capacity to manage labor. But I argue the change is not as dramatic as it's sometimes portrayed. There were waves of repression before Xi, after all, and there have been some minor reforms to labor policy under him as well. What are some of the broader implications of the book? First, contradicting both the transitology and resilience paradigms and research on authoritarianism, which both treat the state as relatively fixed, either as unable to adapt, therefore on the verge of collapse or as some sort of omniscient puppet master, I show that day-to-day -day change in autocratic rule is real and worth studying. Social movements have an impact outside of democracies. And broad shifts in governance, not just individual wins and losses and individual disputes are observable. Autocracies are maybe best understood as nesting regimes within regimes, each with their own model of control. Protest clearly builds the state, but it also warps it, sends it in contradictory directions. Maybe most basically, my book cautions against overly linear understandings of political change. And for supporters of Chinese workers and their movement, the book gives reasons for both optimism and pessimism. Thank you. I'll end uh, right there and, and, uh, and hear uh, what you all have to say. Great, <clears throat> wonderful. Thanks, uh, Manfred. So now what we'll do is turn over to uh, Yao. And if you could uh, offer some of your own thoughts uh, in reaction to Manfred's uh, argument, and I know you've obviously had many discussions in the past as well. So we really appreciate you, Yao, uh, joining us from China. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this excellent book. Congratulations, Manfred, again. So as a former colleague of Manfred's at the Ash Center, uh, indeed, I've read the draft of the book manuscript, or part of it a few times. But this time, read, reading this whole um, book, I still learned so many new things. And so generally, I think that uh, workers and change in China provides a complex and dynamic picture of labor unrest and its political impact in China, as Manfred has already um, elaborated in his presentation. And this book is based on rich data from various sources. I'm really impressed by the rich information that Manfred has collected during his field work, his many years field work in China. And it shows his effort and his time and his uh, energy on this. And also this book is based on solid statistical analysis and detailed interview information, as well as careful observation from the field. So for anyone who is interested in China, labor, social movements, our contentious politics and social justice, I think this book is a must read, highly recommended. So bye. <laughs> so for uh, initiating our discussion today, I have some uh, following thoughts and questions uh, for the audience and for, uh, for, for Manfred. So first, uh, it's about the change in the forms of labor 
unrest. Um, the change, the changes in the forms of labor unrest, as Manfred has already demonstrated, is among the key themes of this book. So the book has discussed the possibility for a change from being more contained forms of resistance to more boundary spanning or transgressive forms of unrest. For instance, as the book states, with time and experience, workers and their allied NGOs would likely uh, to become bolder and better at protesting. Um, and this might be seen in labor unrest in the uh, Yangtze River Delta region. Then the following question is, how about another direction of change? That is a shift from more boundary spanning or transgressive resistance to more contained protest. So is this a uh, direction of change taking place in China right now? Or will it take place in the uh, Pearl River region, Pearl River Delta region in, that, uh, in particular? As argued in the book, one characteristic or feature of labor activism in the Pearl River Delta region is its labor NGOs more active engagement in openly organizing and negotiating ends of strikes. Yet, as this book also mentioned, labor organizations have been under increasing pressure and repression from the state and tend to become more quiet in participating in collective bargaining or labor unrest. So they are standing at much less, uh, standing much less at the forefront than before. And the one example is showed in the quote from Memphis uh, presentation is about the uh, contrast between the PRD and the YRD region, the labor activist comments on the state attitudes toward their organization. So that's crackdown on labor organizations and the chilling political impact, political environment have any influence or impact on the forms of labor resistance, particularly in the PRD region. So pushing it from more boundary spanning or transgressive resistance to more contained contention in that region. So that is my first question. Uh, the second question is about the change uh, in responsive capacity. So I'm wondering whether a Memphis thoughts on establishing or strengthening party branches in foreign or private companies for, for example, Mary Kay, uh, an American company producing cosmetic products, etc. Um, it has a, a bench in Shanghai. So Mary Kay in Shanghai has been developing and uh, has already formed a party branch uh, within its company uh, in just a few years ago. So how do these uh, formal institutions, such as the party branches, uh, affect the state responsive capacity to labor unrest and beyond the party branch. So what about uh, other newly developed formal institutions for public participation and collecting information uh, in general would affect the state's responsive capacity to labor unrest. Uh, one example is about the mayor's mailbox which has been uh, studied uh, in previous research. And how about the uh, newly established, uh, re relatively newly established party mass service center, which is called Dang Qun Fu Zhongxin. So these party mass service centers, they collect people's complaints and give responses later. So how about this increasingly more open, um, increasingly formal institutions would uh, um, maybe, uh, um, kind of affect the state's responsive capacity to respond to labor unrest. And third, uh, third thing is it's rather a comment. Uh, it's a comment rather than a question. So about the outcomes of movements, which is the other very important topic in Manfred's book. Um, um, when we talk about the outcomes of movements, uh, while emphasizing worker resistance uh, has powerful impact on governance in China. Uh, it would be also interesting to make a comparison 
between the state reactions and corresponding policy change in reaction to resistance across different types of protests. Uh, that is, so for uh, some protests, the state may be more, uh, maybe give more, uh, may, may become more responsive, whereas for other protests, the state is less responsive. Uh, so uh, specifically, uh, one example is about the veteran protest. Uh, although the state has imposed uh, some uh, harsh puni punishments on some veteran activists, it also made real concessions uh, to their protest. And also it established a um, former institution, uh, for, for example, the veteran service centers across the nation in response to the veterans forceful protests. So uh, for this veteran protest, the state is very responsive and has made, made real formal changes. Um, by contrast, for protest against the waste incineration in China, um, and the waste incineration um, uh, in the past several, uh, in the past decade, uh, at least 73 um, uh, significant uh, anti waste protests have been um, seen in China across the nation. Uh, so since 2014, uh, the government generally took various uh, measures to push the, the unpopular incineration projects. Um, despite forceful protest. That is, even when thousands or even tens of thousands took to the streets, um, protest against the waste incineration project. Uh, in many cases, after 2014, the government is usually um, took a hard line against those protesters. And uh, we do see an incineration boom in the past decade, despite national, uh, despite waves of uh, forceful protest across the nation. So. Uh, one reason uh, might, might be that the state's determination to develop incineration as the primary measures of waste management in China. So considering the comparison between different protests, um, so uh, although grassroots resistance can have powerful impact on governance, whether protest is in line or against the state's major policies, uh, I think is an uh, is another important factor to consider when we discuss the impact of resistance and corresponding governance, governance change in China. So I'm wondering to, uh, I'm eager to hear your thoughts on this, my friend. And uh, last uh, uh, comment is about the technical issue. So you have many detailed interview quotes and um, I'm very impressed about that. And some are conversations made where you were working with the interviews or having dinner together. So you mentioned that you generally didn't record the interviews or conversation, but two quick, uh, quick jottings later. So <laughs> I was amazed at your ability for recollecting so many details of the conversation. So would you like to share some of your tips for doing this? Okay, I'll stop there and uh, give the audience more opportunities for the Q&A. Raising questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Yao. That, that's great. I just want to say one an aside. I think <clears throat> this sort of interaction it, it reminds me of how wonderful it was to have both of you together here because um, you, you, we were fortunate that both of you were uh, focused in writing uh, books on this question of protests uh, and labor movements, which was wonderful. And uh, it's just great to see the interaction. I, Manfred, I'm interested in your questions. I'll add a few as well. And uh, I, I, my experience was always that the biggest challenge with her last point was the 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 alcohol consumption and then the the conflict with trying to actually re recall what what happened during the dinner and take notes. I remember desperately trying to uh, balance that uh, challenge. Yes, I I very much uh, miss having the opportunity to uh, bounce ideas off of uh, Yao on a on a daily uh, basis. Um, and this was a great set of uh, questions and comments. I'll deal with them in the same order um, uh, that uh, she raised them. Uh, first of all, the data, uh, the best data we have about strikes and protests by Chinese workers right now isn't my China strikes data set, it's the China labor bulletin data set that's been kept up to the date to the present. And it seems uh, to indeed show a decline uh, 
in uh, activism in the last couple of years. Now that might partially be uh, just the result of uh, poor reporting of protests. And I personally think uh, a big part of it is exactly that. Uh, fewer people posting things online and the loss of um, other activists who were uh, collecting uh, these online reports uh, before they got to CLB. Uh, but if indeed uh, activism is uh, slowing down, uh, there are a bunch of different possible reasons for it. In the book, I very much focus on bottom-up pressures, uh, but I have to acknowledge uh, that top-down pressures are significant as well, and the national political climate and um, local authorities, policies uh, are, are likely having some impact on workers' uh, calculations. I'm focusing on one direction of causality, uh, but that other direction uh, uh, can't be um, neglected entirely. When it comes to the role of NGOs, uh, certainly uh, they've been uh, cracked down on, almost eliminated in Guangdong province, or at least sort of for forced into more sort of uh, benign uh, service oriented avenues of work, you know, migrant children's education, uh, that kind of thing. My instinct, and I haven't uh, uh, tested this, but my instinct is that um, that's not a big part of the story. Um, there were a lot of NGOs in Guangdong uh, but uh, compared to the number of workers there, they were still small in number and influence. And I would guess uh, bigger factors are either those top-down uh, pressures or uh, maybe uh, more so just straight changing structural uh, conditions in uh, the Pearl River Delta and elsewhere. Um, uh, so light manufacturing has been drying up for a while, um, migrant workers have been returning inland. And my guess is that that's a bigger driver of whatever uh, downturn in protests uh, might exist uh, than, than other things. Uh, but, but that all uh, uh, deserves to be uh, tested more rigorously, rigorously. With regard to different forms of responsiveness via party branches and companies or the mayor's mailbox and that kind of thing, uh, that's also uh, an interesting idea to take up. Um, the studies I've seen of the use of the mayor's mailbox so far have tended to focus on a sort of property issues or uh, welfare issues, people wanting to get different welfare benefits uh, from the government and less so uh, labor disputes uh, per se. Um, but to the extent uh, that these things are expanding in, uh, in tandem uh, with uh, worker protests, it, it would sort of fit with my argument. I think a more uh, interesting uh, or, or more significant from labor's perspective form of responsiveness in just the last year has been the government's crackdown on uh, the platform economy. Uh, so moves to uh, make um, uh, DD or Meituan uh, workers, um, something approaching full employees uh, rather than just uh, subcontractors, um, little you know symbolic but maybe nonetheless meaningful gestures like a bureaucrat in Beijing spending a day uh, delivering food for one of these companies. These kind of things, I think. Uh, add up uh, to a, a you know a significant uh, uh, gesture of uh, conciliation uh, to workers uh, to go with the increased uh, crackdowns we've seen in the last uh, couple of years. And again, uh, like uh, Yao suggested, uh, with uh, the crackdowns, it might double back to shape uh, workers' actions uh, to some degree. Um, Yao has done much more work uh, than I have on how the government responds to very different types of protests and who uh, tends to be treated harshly and who uh, tends to be uh, treated in a, a more understanding manner. Um, 
The book focuses on uh, workers first and foremost, and in the final chapter, I, I lay out some different sort of scope conditions on the argument and say, for example, that it doesn't apply very well to, to uh, religious minorities who are protesting, for instance. But I think uh, Yao's point raises a bigger issue, which is that there are more parties at work here than just the protesters and the government. Uh, in her example of, um, of uh, waste uh, incineration projects, um, uh, you know, various chemical plant projects, uh, that kind of thing, uh, you not only have different levels of the government uh, that bear the cost of uh, canceling a project to different degrees, but you also have private actors mixed in, a uh, big, powerful companies. And uh, if there's something uh, I would work into an expanded version of my book that was twice as long or whatever, uh, it would be uh, more sort of uh, tripartite analysis where capital is worked into the story in a more uh, complete manner. Uh, workers are pressuring uh, business people. Business people are pressuring the government about the pressures that they get from workers. And I think you know, bringing all the actors in uh, would uh, enrich the argument uh, considerably and would enrich a lot of these uh, social movement uh, studies from China, I think, too. Um, regarding, finally, uh, Yao's point about uh, interviewing, um, I don't know that I have a perfect system. Uh, what I did was I... Uh, was not shy about carrying around a notebook with me um, and having it on the table or in a taxi cab or at a work site and writing in it, uh, but writing um, in a very messy fashion often. And I'd try as soon as I was done with the meeting uh, to pull out uh, my netbook uh, which for uh, younger uh, viewers of this um, presentation uh, was a, a sort of precursor to iPads and that sort of thing. Uh, it's like a $200 uh, computer that ran really slowly. Um, and I'd type up all my notes and sort of fill in the gaps as quickly as I could and sort of flesh out the details, you know, find a restaurant uh, or coffee shop after I just met with someone and sit down and type things up. Um, uh, Baijiu consumption is uh, sort of a, a, a two-edged sword, I think. It, it means that people are, are more open in their discussions. Uh, it means uh, that you yourself are more open. It also uh, complicates that process of, of taking notes and writing things up afterward. But I remember at least uh, one instance uh, uh, where there's sort of a big banquet and I had furiously taken notes and, and I dizzily uh, returned to my hotel room and just sort of forced myself to sit there and type uh, for quite a while and was glad that I, I did so. Thank you, Ranford, that's, that's great. And, and yeah, of course, jump in as well. I'll, I'll, there are a couple um, interesting questions here uh, and I have one as well that actually dovetail quite well with some of the questions that Yao put forward. One is from uh, just more immediate from David Dappas, one of our, our colleagues and economist, who basically is asking a bit of a follow on to what Yao had raised and what you just mentioned in terms of, you know, for example, the move to light industry. Um, is do we find that there's an important economic sort of substructure that's driving a bit of this um, in terms of your argument? And are, are and in some ways, as factories either automate um, or search for higher value-added labor, right, sort of upskilled labor to move up the value chain, um, is, do, is in some ways there are a lot of pressure for better treatment of, the, of at least more highly skilled labor um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, given the, the automation that we know occurs or at least outsourcing to other, uh, offshore and other countries, um, maybe the opposite is true for a lot of the labor that has been let go that is lower skilled. Um, and so I'm adding a little bit as well to that question. Any thoughts there, Manfred? So um, 
On the first part of whether uh, automation has raised the treatment of high-skilled workers, um, I suspect that's true uh, to some degree, even as it brings uh, new uh, pressures to their lives. And you can see that in uh, surveys uh, that uh, some scholars based in China have done of workers uh, in, again, the Pearl River Delta versus the Yangtze River Delta. And uh, they've noted sort of generally uh, better um, working conditions across a range of measures for the Yangtze River Delta workers in sort of more high value added, higher um, uh, skilled, or, or if we don't want to use the word higher skilled, sort of requiring more training um, uh, jobs, with the exception, strangely, of, of healthcare in particular. So I think that that might be true uh, to some degree. Uh, with regards to the, uh, the workers um, uh, still working in, in uh, light industry, lower value added jobs, I think it's sort of a complicated picture because uh, a lot of that industry is moving inland. So like I said, it's sort of drying up in Guangdong, uh, but not all of it's moving abroad. Some of it's moving uh, really closer to the hometowns of workers. And uh, I did a little bit of interviewing of workers in uh, Nanchong in uh, Sichuan. Um, and uh, those workers uh, were people who'd worked on the coast and then uh, came uh, back to their hometown to work in a factory in their hometown. And in a lot of ways, their lives have been improved by this process. They weren't cut off from their families. They could return home uh, to their children and their parents uh, at the end of the day. Uh, what will be interesting, I think, going forward, and other people have been asking, um, is whether working in one's hometown rather than the coast sort of empowers one to take more action on the shop floor. You know, you've got your whole community around you. You're not vulnerable in the same way, uh, or if it sort of dampens activism. Uh, the experience of the Yangtze River Delta and the Pearl River Delta, you know, suggests maybe it would dampen activism. There are more local workers in the Yangtze River Delta than the Pearl River Delta, but uh, this, you know, remains to something to study. Great, thank you. And the other is you, um, I think importantly, both in the book, but also uh, in your final slide today, you sort of importantly distinguish your work from those other two um, uh, in cycles of books, which one was effectively sort of, you called sort of the transition or transitology, right? To, to what extent, you know, many books came out in the, in the 80s and 90s, where the argument was, well, let's look for the ways in which the CCP really is actually weakening and we see moments or windows for transition. That then led to the more current um, thread, which is around resilient authoritarianism. And, and you, I think, do a pretty good job uh, explaining the ways in which your, your book is, is differentiated. And one of them, I think, one of the points you make that's important is, um, you argue that the CCP's approach to repression and responsiveness is actually quite resource intensive, right? So, for example, budgets on, um, on various forms of, um, of, the, of, of the, the Gongan, Guan, those types of forces. And what you're really talking about there is sort of the trade offs, right? That other things that could be done with those types of resources, which in many ways is kind of the, the, the guns versus butter. Um, uh, decision. So could you speak a little bit about what, because I think it's an important point, what are those trade-offs and, and what does that mean for the ability, um, given your analysis, of, of, for the CCP to remain resilient and, 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 and continue? So I do see a lot of uh, trade-offs at work here. Uh, guns versus butter in the sense of public security edging out, um, local welfare spending that uh, would benefit a broader population. Uh, public security also uh, edging out uh, potentially a national defense spending. So uh, uh, guns versus guns in that case. And then there are also trade-offs that aren't about budgets. Uh, as uh, lots of people have uh, studied, 
The government uh, made a concerted effort uh, in the 80s and more so in the 90s and early 2000s to build close ties uh, with private uh, business people, with what uh, Dixon calls you know, red capitalists. And concessions to workers uh, fray those relationships somewhat. Uh, business people I met with, uh, both uh, domestic business people and business people from Taiwan and elsewhere, uh, were grumbling about how the government had resolved uh, their disputes with their workers. And at the same time, uh, the gestures the government has made uh, so far uh, in terms of responsiveness haven't necessarily won over workers. I show how uh, in public opinion surveys, migrant workers consistently score lower in their appraisal of the government than other groups um, year after year. So then there's just a, a sort of broader issue too of lining these things upright uh, so that you don't encourage uh, workers with your responsiveness or fuel new grievances with your crackdowns. And it's a tricky balance to pull off. And so I compare China uh, to like a tree growing in loose soil with power lines running through it and stuff. It's growing, it's progressing, it's adapting. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not you know, about to topple over, but it gets all twisted out of shape uh, trying uh, to, to dodge these different challenges. And I think the government's uh, reactions to pressure from uh, labor are, are like that. Great, thank you. The few other um, quick questions. The, we have another from, uh, from the audience, which is uh, actually related to this, two, two issues you mentioned. One is the common prosperity um, policy, and the second is the crackdown on platform companies like Meituan, for example, yeah. labor abuse. Um, <clears throat> so do you think that those sort of twin policies, um, are they significant in terms of mitigating workers' grievances and, 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 their, and therefore in addressing them? Um, and therefore, maybe in the end, net effect would be lower, uh, lowering workers' um, uh, unrest and resistance given those, those important moves or not? Um, I think there are significant uh, forms of responsiveness. And some of the things the government's doing, uh, like uh, moves uh, to make some of these um, delivery workers real employees, uh, could turn out to be um, pretty effective. But uh, on the balance, I'm not sure that, uh, that they're enough uh, to, on their own, bring uh, labor unrest in those sectors under control. Uh, some of the things that are being done are, are uh, at, at least at present, pretty hollow, like this push to set up trade unions in, uh, in platform companies. Uh, it, it feels, uh, I've said elsewhere, a little like the government's just sort of assigning the sanitation department to go take care of a bunch of trash that's in the street or something. It's like, oh, this is a worker problem union. You go deal with it. But there's no sort of change in how the union approaches workers. The union's uh, you know, functioning hasn't been upgraded in some way. It's just been sort of assigned the task of setting up branches in these companies. So I, I, at, at least so far, I don't think that matters that much. And all of these uh, gestures, um, uh, whether you know, significant ones or, or what I think are more hollow ones, have to be balanced against the uh, crackdowns that the government has launched as well. So uh, many of the listeners may be uh, familiar with a delivery worker uh, um, who's, who's called uh, Mengju, um, who, um, who has... Uh, been active online, uh, giving uh, workers space to share problems who are in the delivery sector, um, uh, pulling people together, and he's been uh, thrown uh, in detention. Uh, so, uh, you know, whatever uh, benefits come from what the government's uh, done are, are balanced against uh, controls uh, uh, too. Another question, uh, which is which is interesting, is the extent to so the political attitudes of, of Chinese workers that you saw. Um, this, uh, Sean is asking, you noted the protests appear to be more directed against companies 
right, than the government itself, sort of basically yeah. economic rights, workplace conditions rights. Um, and there's other examples like the Marxist students in Shenzhen. D d could you talk a little bit about, is there a rise in uh, anti-government attitudes uh, or maybe more specifically uh, related to uh, companies is anti-capitalist or anti-privatization, for example. What are those sort of more political attitudes rather than simply sort of anti-company or, or pro-working uh, um, conditions, for example? Well, I think labor disputes anywhere in the world just by nature are going to be primarily focused on employers. Um, before they uh, extend uh, to the state or, or, or other actors. I think that's just sort of inherent in the capital labor relationship. Um, that said, Chinese workers have always uh, been or, or have generally been uh, quite careful uh, to uh, couch their demands in uh, economic rather than political terms. Uh, and I think that extends even to some degree to the Marxist uh, students. They didn't direct their criticism at uh, Xi Jinping um, or the party per se, although they, um, they uh, made powerful arguments that the party uh, had gone astray. Uh, they didn't set themselves up as explicitly anti-government. Um, that said, uh, whether the language is anti-government or not, uh, the breaking down of barriers, the spreading of unrest uh, between different groups of people, uh, linking up of different sorts is taken really seriously by authorities. And it falls in that category of transgressive activism that I identified and uh, is the reason I think that the government came down uh, so hard on those uh, students, you know, packing some of them into vans on the side of, of campuses or making them come out and do confession videos and that kind of thing. It was the uh, presence of workers and students together uh, that I think was uh, frightening uh, more than anything that the students or the workers said. The other two quick questions. One is, and you touched on this a bit, but I think if people are interested, how reliable are statistics on labor unrest? Just you know, your your take on that. You know, it's not in the interest of provincial officials offering to document them. On the that's one. Um, and the other is just if you could close with a little bit of the boundary conditions, scope conditions, like you said in the book, it would be helpful. There's a question, for example, you know, for for um, for example, Uyghurs being sent to factories in the uh, in in the in the east. Um, and what would be the difference of, if you disaggregate effectively these workers, like Yao was saying, uh, how would that reaction be different? Some things are driven uh, are driven for, for very different reasons, obviously, given the identity of, of the worker. So on the statistics, uh, the short answer is that they're, they're imperfect. Um, there are a bunch of different uh, academic and advocacy groups efforts at counting contention in China. So I have my China strikes map. Uh, Yao has uh, collected some great data on protest drawing on, on uh, sources like uh, the Boshin uh, dissident site. Uh, there's China Labor Bulletin's map. Uh, there are people who've taken the Wikidana uh, archive of social media posts concerning protest and built data sets out of that. There are even people um, um, who are, are using a machine learning uh, to identify protests in social uh, media. So there's a whole span of these different efforts and they're all imperfect. Uh, they're not a substitute for official strike statistics, say like a lot of countries uh, collect. Uh, that said, uh, their patterns are believable. Uh, my data set, for instance, uh, shows an upswing in unrest around the 2008 financial crisis. And then again, in 2010, around very different demands when the economy was booming and workers had a lot of uh, leverage over employers. Most of the data sets show a real seasonal up and down too, with an unsurprising you know, spike right before spring festival when people uh, need to get paid before they go home and then a lull during the spring festival and during particular holidays. Uh, so they have believable characteristics and they sort of match with the closest things we can find in official data uh, to uh, protest um, 
numbers. So for instance, in the world of labor, the government does release information on formally adjudicated employment disputes, so disputes that are brought to mediation, arbitration, and court. And they break those down by uh, province at least, and those you know roughly track protests. Not perfectly, and in the real world, sometimes one uh, is a substitute for, for the other rather than coming together, but they roughly track, which I think makes this data believable enough. Uh, and when researchers use it, I think the best practice uh, that most people adopt is to throw in a bunch of controls for things that they think might bias the data, you know, controls for the province, controls for the year, uh, that kind of thing. Um, on the point about uh, Uyghurs and sort of labor transfer programs and moving people from Xinjiang to the coast, um, my uh, impression uh, here, and I'd be interested to know uh, what people who, who focus on Xinjiang uh, would have to say about this, but my impression is that um, disputes involving uh, Uyghurs, uh, disputes involving Tibetans, uh, uh, disputes perhaps involving other groups are often approached uh, from a, uh, a uh, national unity, um, um, uh, territorial uh, uh, control uh, perspective, uh, rather uh, than always uh, from you know the the uh, bear dispute at hand. So a labor dispute on a uh, railroad in uh, Tibet is more likely to be uh, treated as a security concern than an employment issue. Uh, that's that's something uh, I'd be interested in other people you know uh, correcting me on if I'm wrong about that, but that's my general impression. Um, I was just glancing at the questions here, and I think part of the question too was sort of the motivation of sending people uh, to work on the coast uh, from Xinjiang um, and, and whether there was sort of an economic um, motivation here to drive down wages or something. My, my guess is uh, that, again, uh, the... Um, the uh, security concerns, the desire for greater control over Xinjiang, uh, efforts to forcibly assimilate Uyghurs or, or dilute their identity in different ways, all of that sort of is uh, a bigger deal uh, than the, than the um, number of workers that can go to a given factory. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be interested too of uh, whether those factories are, are really eager to have workers from labor transfer programs uh, because uh, they're cheaper or they're, um, they're uh, monitored by the authorities or whether this is seen as sort of a burden that they're taking on uh, for, the, for the government. I, this is a little bit outside of my expertise and, and uh, like uh, you said, Ed sort of shows the scope conditions around my argument, but these are really interesting uh, issues and deserve uh, more study. I tend I tend to agree with you on on, on those points, uh, um, but you know we could of course talk for for, for many more hours. Of we I know we, we've now reached the bewitching hour effectively. So um, again, I want to thank you, Manfred, from uh, for your work, of course, um, for returning and uh, for joining us from uh, British Columbia and Canada. Uh, Yao, same. Thank you for joining us from Jiangxi, currently at China, where you are at the moment. Um, thank you for lending your expertise uh, and your thoughts. We really love uh, bringing old friends back together and alumni like you. And thank for, I also thank everyone else for, uh, for joining us and um, have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for a wonderful conversation.